As we look back on the events of April 14, 1912, we witness the serene majesty of the Titanic's voyage marred by the chilling encounter with an iceberg. The collision, occurring at 11.40 p.m., shattered the illusion of invincibility surrounding the magnificent vessel. Panic and confusion swept through the decks as passengers and crew grappled with a sudden shift from opulence to impending peril. As we transition into the early morning hours of April 15, 1912, the sinking of the Titanic enters its first hour. Amidst the chaos and darkness, the ship's distress signals pierce the night sky, pleading for aid in the vast expanse of the North Atlantic. Lifeboats are being lowered into the frigid waters, with their capacity woefully inadequate for the sheer number of souls on board. Despite the valiant efforts of the crew to maintain order, fear and desperation grips the hearts of those on board as the icy waters rise higher. In the face of impending tra tragedy, acts of courage and compassion emerge amidst the chaos, illuminating the human spirit resilience in the face of adversity. As the clock inches towards 1 a.m., the full scale of the disaster becomes painfully clear. Join us as we bear witness to the unfolding tragedy honoring the memory of those who face the ultimate test of survival amidst the icy depths of the North Atlantic Ocean. Today, 112 years ago, the Titanic is doomed to sink. 20 minutes ago, the ship struck an iceberg at 11.40 p.m. on April 14, 1912, compromised at five of the major watertight compartments and a tear into the four coal bunker for boiler room number five. Titanic is stopped true north-northwest, 400 miles south from the coast of Newfoundland. All right, so in this part, we're actually going to divide it into three separate parts. The first hour, the second hour, and of course the final 20 minutes and the rescue from the Carpathia and also the trip back to New York as well. While we're not going to cover all of the events that actually did happen, we're actually going to cover some of the major ones that actually did occur as the ship was sinking. A character that we previously talked about in the last video is a man by the name of 4th Officer Joseph Boxhall who carried out his own inspection. He knows if he couldn't get into the mail room, boiler room 6, or the cargo holds. He immediately reported back to the captain to notify him that the damage is worse, that any possibility of the iceberg causing minimal damage had gone out the window. Once Smith received word from Boxhall, he ordered him to wake up the remaining off-duty officers, and Mooney got with some crew to get an aft port lifeboat set up. Thomas Andrews conducted his own inspection and conducted mathematical guesses. He went down below to inspect the damage via working stairs. As passengers were woken up, they were already told to put on warm clothes and come up onto the boat deck with their life jackets on. Majority of the first class were already roused up because of their slumber was interrupted, and they stayed in warm public spaces. Now, Captain Smith actually ordered lifeboats to be swung out and ready in case of evacuation, but doing so in a noisy environment is actually proven difficult as crew members had to get close to one another had to yell at the top of their lungs next to someone. Now, the best way I can actually do describe this is from the 1997 Titanic film during the prepping of the lifeboats. Now, I'm going to play a scene from that movie, and note to headphone users, this scene is going to be incredibly loud, so just want to take this opportunity right now to turn down your headphones, because I am not responsible for the loss of hearing that's going to come up. So, in three, two, one. <laughs> All right, now listen to me. The ship has been seriously damaged. The captain's ordered the boat swung up. It's got to be done quickly. Yeah, so that actually proves how difficult it is for the crew to communicate with one another out on the boat deck. Now, there was this documentary I actually did watch called Titanic 25 Years Later with James Cameron. There was an experiment that was actually tested with a replica of a lifeboat complete with the data cranes to see how long it takes for the lifeboat to be set up. Now, it actually did took 8 minutes and 30 seconds to get the boat set up and lower to the edge of the boat deck, then an additional 10 minutes just for loading. It also took 2 minutes to go to 10 feet. It also take an additional 40 more and 8 minutes to go down to the water, which actually results in 30 minutes and 27 seconds. Now keep this in mind though, if the lifeboats were loaded all the way up and down the whole boat deck, they wouldn't be able to get all of them off in time. They were actually lucky to get the last two floated off, but that's going to be another video until later on. 
So as the passengers were actually still roused up, you know, the ship's orchestra was actually led by Wallace Hartley actually began to play a variety of music from waltzes to marches to cheer up passengers that kept everyone calm. But there wasn't actually much calm going on in the second class promenade as a second class passenger by the name of Charlotte Collier said there was a great number of passengers gathered at the second class promenade as officers were shouting that there's no danger. The Thomas Andrews came up from below and he had this look of worry because Titanic is his ship, this is his girl, he knows that she is in trouble. So he went to inform Captain Smith saying, yep, yeah, we're done, this ship's got an hour. But with that, Captain Smith actually ordered the crew to begin loading and launching lifeboats as the evacuation of the Titanic now fully begins. At 12.27 a.m., Jackville transmits out Titanic's first CQD distress call. The problem is that Captain Smith gave out the wrong coordinates and try to find out where you're at in the middle of the ocean using the stars is very difficult. Since there is a lot of math to it, to which we will not go over in this video, the first ship to receive Titanic's first CQD distress call from the German ship to Frankfurt. They asked what the matter with the Titanic was, and since the Frankfurt is German, there's an operator and a translator on board. Now keep this in mind though, there is a language barrier. More ships that also received the CQD distress calls were the Mount Temple, for whom they cannot hear due to the noise of steam, Cape Race, to which Jack Phillips has been communicating with all night, near Paranga, and finally the Carpathia. But there's going to be a lot more that will come on, like the RMS Olympic. Boxhaw also came into the wireless room to provide updated coordinates since their position is off. Now, this ship we hadn't talked about since earlier in the documentary is the Carpathia. So, we haven't talked about that ship for quite a while. So, the last time I actually did mention this ship was back on April 11th as the ship left from, from New York City on a voyage to Austria Hungary. Now, this is where the ship comes into the story of the RMS Titanic. The man you see in this photo is Harold Cottam. He is a wireless operator to the RMS Carpathia on the night of the sinking of the Titanic. The story goes as he signed off for the night, and just like Bryson Phillips, he's a technical wizard himself. He went back to the wireless room to put on his headset to listen to any more incoming messages within the outside world. He receives transmission from a station in Cape Cod, Massachusetts, and these messages were intended for the Titanic. And for the rest, well, I'll let this independent film called The Last Signals by HFX Studios explain the rest. I have another one. MPA, MPA. It's the Carpathia, the Carpathia. Do you know Cape Cod is sending a batch of... Holy hell, MGY, come at... Once we have struck a bug, it's a CQD, old man. Position 41, 44 north, 50, 24 west. Shall I tell my captain? Yes, come at once. So at this very same time, two events actually also did happen. One is the lowering of lifeboat number seven, and Harold Cotton tells Captain Arthur Rostrand, but getting to Captain Rost Rostrand is not going to be that easy. You see, Cotton tells the officers of the watch that the Titanic is sinking, and at first the officers just kind of, you know, told him off, you know, saying that someone's pulling his leg, and, and yes, this is for context, there are trolls, Back in 1912, like what we have today on the internet. Basically, what operators would like to do is basically abuse the Marconi system to send out fake CQD distress calls for no reason whatsoever. However, Cottom was actually rebuttal. Like, he wasn't going to take no for an answer from the uh, officers and decided, you know what, I'm going to bust through Captain Rostrand's room regardless if he was sleeping out and he did and however Rostron was actually furious with Cotton you know telling him off you know about not knocking first before entering because he is a captain but once Rostron received that CQD distress call from the Titanic he actually took it all in and and discussed saying okay here's the coordinates and let's turn the ship towards Titanic's position However, it would actually take them about four hours 
for them to get to the Titanic's position. And at that time, they will be gone. Back on the Titanic, the first lifeboat to be lowered away was lifeboat number 7. The boat only had a capacity of 28 and was built to handle 65. And at this time, it has nearly been an hour since the Titanic struck an iceberg and is currently sinking. No one knows the seriousness of the situation yet. At 12.40 a.m., Lifeboat 7 successfully touches the water. A man by the name of Archie Jewell is on this lifeboat and is one of the six lookouts that survived altogether. He would also survive the sinking of the HMHS Britannic later in life, but died five years and two days later on the SS Donegal during World War I. But that's a story for another time. Now, another thing I actually do want to go over is the women and children first rule. Now, at first, there were actually two conflicting orders that were actually given out. One was First Officer William Murdoch, who has been lowering lifeboats on the starboard side of the ship, actually took the order of women and children first. He did allow men on if there were room. Now, early on, he didn't allow any men on, but once it actually got closer and closer to the end, he actually didn't hesitate to let anyone in, of course. Charles Lightoller, however, the second officer who was in charge of the port side, actually took the order of women and children only, which means that if you're a male, you need to step aside let the uh, women and children board only. So that's why there were actually half-filled lifeboats that were actually lowered in the ocean early on. At 12.45 a.m., Lifeboat 5 was the second lifeboat to be lowered under the command of 3rd Officer Herbert Pittman with a capacity of 36 out of 65, but this boat had some troubles during the lowering as one side went too low and had to stop. The problem was corrected and Lifeboat 5 is lowered safely into the water. A few minutes later, the first distress rocket is launched. Up on the boat deck, a panicking Ismay started grabbing the ropes to Lifeboat 5, yelling out, lower away, lower away. Fifth Officer Harold Lowe, who witnessed this, told him off by saying, if you will get the hell out of the way, I shall be able to do something. Then proceed to ask him, do you want me to lower away quickly? And you will have me drown a whole lot of them. Harold Lowe's stern words actually remind Ismay that he is in no position to tell the crew what to do as he is simply a passenger regardless if he is the chairman of the White Star Line. Now during the night, Titanic actually fired up rockets at different intervals and each of them were actually in a different color ranging from blue to white to red. Now in maritime regulations, to fire up rockets in a signal of distress, you have to fire them off at one minute intervals. It doesn't matter which color it is, it's just... The timing matters. The 1912 International Rules of the Road governing about the signals of distress are very clear whatsoever. Article 31, Class 1 calls for a cannon or explosive device with a report fired off at one minute intervals, and Article 31, Class 3 cover the signal of distress, which is a rock of any color fired one minute in short intervals. Well, sure that the Titanic was actually indeed firing rockets whatsoever, but not at the one minute intervals as the uh, rule suggested. At Lifeboat 8, the noise of the steam finally stopped as Charles Lightoller finally loaded up the port side lifeboats only with women and children. This area of the ship is notable due to two notable passengers, Isidore and Ida Strauss, both co-owners of the Macy's department store in New York City, who were up on the boat deck together. Isidore tells Ida to get into a lifeboat, but Ida refused to part ways with her husband. A man by the name of Hugh Wolner went up to talk to Isidore and let him know that they wouldn't mind if they took a spot in lifeboat 8. Isidore refused this offer and said that he would not board a lifeboat before the rest of the men, women, and children on the ship. Due to this testimony by Wolner, we know about this exchange that it did happen on board the ship. At 12.55 a.m., Lifeboat 3 is lowered away with 32 occupied seats built for 65, and at the same time, a second rocket is launched into the night sky. Bruce Ismay, who calmed down after a heated exchange with, after his little run-in with 5th Officer Harold Lowe and being scolded by him, he finally calmed down and already assisted passengers into Lifeboat number 3. Once they got that done, they moved aft towards Lifeboats 9, 11, 13, and 15. And at this very same time, Lifeboat 8 is lowered into the water as this boat already has an occupancy of 25 out of 65 seats. This is one of the few half-filled lifeboats that would be lowered into the ocean. And now with that first hour out of the way, the first hour and 20 minutes have now been covered. 
The next hour and 20 minutes is when the seriousness of the sinking of the Titanic really picks up. As the clock strikes 1 a.m., the Titanic's fate hangs in the balance. In the frigid waters of the North Atlantic, a battle between human resilience and the relentless force of nature unfolds. On board the Titanic, a somber calm sails over the remaining passengers and crew, their faces etched with a mixture of fear and resignation. In these darkest of hours, the true measure of human courage and compassion is put into the ultimate test. Amidst the chaos and despair, the acts of heroism emerge as individuals strive to comfort and support one another. But as the minutes slip by, the Titanic's strength wanes once her mighty form succumbing to the relentless pressure of the ocean depths. And then, in a moment that will echo through the annals of history, Titanic breaks apart, her hull fracturing under the immense strength. Join us as we bear witness to the final hour of the Titanic's journey, a testament to the indomitable spirit of those who sailed aboard her and the enduring legacy of one of history's greatest tragedies.